yeah, I'm quite excited to be here. Um, so actually, um, I envy the US for doing a much better job on what we usually call outreach, meaning telling the general public, but also people like you, physics teachers, who are not really general at all because you're physicists like us, telling others what we are doing. We don't do that much in Europe. And it's a pity because it's a, it's a great opportunity for us also to reflect on what we are doing. And our science found, foundation uh, funding agencies, they actually don't care whether we do that. In the US, you don't get funding if you don't do it. So for us, it doesn't exist. So if I do a bad job, it's because of that. Okay. <laughs> Good, so um, yeah. Interplay of interactions and topology in a crystal. Um, so I'm from uh, Vienna, as was already said, and my group is called Quantum Materials. So we are talking about quantum phenomena in crystals. And I'm supposed to be well uh, equipped to tell you about that. Uh, let's see <laughs> what I can do. Um, OK, so the program that we are having here is uh, called a quantum universe in a crystal, as you've heard already from the introduction of Jimmy C symmetry and topology across the correlation spectrum. So we somehow want to now talk about correlations in the setting and correlations in interactions between the electrons we sort of use as synonym of each other. So we want to not only talk about what a single electron does in a crystal, but how electrons interact with each other in a crystal. So you have heard these big numbers of electrons, the big numbers of atoms, like 10 to power 23, that's the Avogadro number, right? This one mole of material has this number of atoms. Um, and then much more electrons than that, because one atom has much more than one electron, right? I mean, typically the number of protons, so the uh, Atomic number Z is the number of protons in the nucleus and thus also the number of electrons in the atom. So we are talking about many, 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 many electrons. But for many of the things that we are doing, for instance, this band structure, this spaghetti, it's an effective single electron theory. We actually don't care that there are so many electrons. So we say that the electrons, even though it's a confusing number, um, they sort of average out the effect of each other, and we can treat a single electron, or at least a single excitation of the electronic system um, in the background of the others, so in the mean field of all the others. And that's a very, very, very efficient way to do it, because we actually do an effective single electron theory. That works for many things you have heard this morning. Uh, in particular, it works to describe or to get out topological aspects of a band structure. So when we really add one-to-one -one electron, electron interactions, all that gets a crazy mess. And we don't really have the tools yet to deal with that. And that's why we're organizing conferences. So we, we have to develop that. It's very hard, but, um, and that's mostly theorists trying to do that. We just measure. For me, actually, when I do a measurement, I don't care whether the electrons are interacting or not. I do the exact same experiment, right? For me, it's not more difficult at all, except for sometimes I have to measure at very low temperatures because correlations develop at low temperatures. So maybe some technical challenge, but the biggest challenge is with the theorists. I'm an experimentalist. Okay, good luck for me. So um, this is the conference we're having next week. Um, topology, symmetry, and interactions. You again have that effect in crystals, emerging concepts, and unifying themes. If we even need to talk about emerging concepts, you know where we are. Huh? Not very far. <laughs> Sorry for the theorists, of course. They think they are very, very far. But the truth is, it's such a hard problem that we are in its infancy. OK, unifying themes, of course, we hope to find this. OK, so what I'm going to do in this lecture is show you one effect, a really stunning effect quite surprising effect, and then go back and see what we need to understand it. And what is this effect? An experimental effect. I do an experiment. I do a very simple experiment. I, if I say I, I don't mean I. I mean my group, my students. And in this particular case, one of my former PhD students, Sami Jabber, so he does an experiment like Peter in the previous talk. 
But he doesn't work, need to work so hard because it's quite obvious, the experiment, if you just do the right thing. So what he does, he measures a Hall effect. We have heard already in the previous talk that a Hall effect is something you feed a current through your metal, you put the magnetic field perpendicular, and you should measure transverse, right? The voltage, the Hall voltage created by the Lorentz force with the right screw. Well, by the way, for me, the reason why I studied physics is I understood this when I was 13. <laughs> no, really, I had a physics teacher, which I loved. This teacher was great. And he explained this to us with the vectors. We didn't know what a vector is at that time, but sort of this thing. I was the only one who got, got it in the class, and he made me come to the front, <laughs> explain how it works. That is velocity. That is the field. That's the force. And I sort of explained oh, I was so proud. And I decided to study physics. Later, I had very bad physics teachers. Even that motivated me to do better, because don't be afraid. If something you can't explain, don't be afraid that the student will not study physics because of that. Just tell him, you know, you probably can't, can do better than me. <laughs> That's another very, very good motivation. So I always said, oh, if she studied physics, I can do better. <laughs> OK, so this is the experiment we did. He did, but he forgot to put the field. He put field zero, and he still measured it. That he did not forget it. He was so clever that he thought I should try without a field. So that's the effect. You measure a Hall effect. You have charged carriers. It's really a metal, what we have, not like this complicated spins and bosons or whatever, like in the previous talk. We really have a metal, or a semi-metal, in fact. We don't put a field, yet we measure a Hall voltage. And it's not a small one, so he didn't really have to work super, super hard to see it. Once he had the idea to test it even in zero field, he had a big effect. So what is that? OK, that's the, the puzzle we are going to solve during this lecture. What is that? And you have a sense already, because you heard already about this Berry curvature. So maybe it has something to do with that, right? I tell you, yes, but we will see it. <laughs> so reminder, I can be very quick here because it was explained uh, by Huang in the previous talk. The Hall effect in simple metals is a result of the Lorentz force acting on a moving charge, uh, which is there because you put an electric field along this direction. You put a magnetic field perpendicular, and there is a deviation, uh, which is described by this Lorentz force. And you can actually, you, you use it a lot in uh, characterizing metals because the strength of this voltage is related to the number of charge carriers that are relevant in your material. You can measure how many charge carriers you have in your system. Okay, but as I said, in our case, we forget the field, and yet it's there. Okay, so why is it interesting? Well, there's two reasons. Uh, one reason is it has a uh, quite high potential for applications. Um, there are devices which can do something interesting to currents or to fields, in fact. Uh, they are called non-reciprocal devices, and they can sort of turn an electric field or a current around the corner. Um, and they are much needed in uh, applications, in particular in microwave applications for quantum technologies, like the quantum computer. Not, for not only for topological quantum computers, but even for normal superconducting qubit quantum computers, because that helps to compensate uh, um, noise and so on, if you can sort of avoid back action in the system. So you need such devices, which are um, can be made, but are very bulky. So that's the way what, what such one such uh, device can look like. There are magnetic fields or ferromagnets inside. It's based on the Hall effect, or this, this uh, uh, implementation is based on the Hall effect, but it's magnetic. So it needs to be shielded. All the rest of the system doesn't want to see fields and so on. So now if we have this material, which does it all by itself, and you know a crystal can be really small. In our case, they are actually small, but you can make them much, much smaller if you want to. That system does it without any field, so you could, in principle, do such non-reciprocal devices with this effect. Okay? And we are, in fact, really collaborating with uh, the group of Andrew Higginbotham at an institute just near Vienna, um, who want to make such a um, non-reciprocal 
device from our materials. Okay, that's motivation one. We always have applications in mind, even if it's in the back of our mind. I don't work directly on applications myself, but I have it in the back of my mind. For me, the more, and more important motivation is new physics. So what is it, right? There is a mystery why this effect exists. And it turns out that both topology and interactions are needed to understand the effect. So uh, there are two logos and two words, while and condo, two persons uh, that have uh, meanings in this context, uh, both male, I can't change it, Mr. Weil and Mr. Kondo, who have put uh, essential um, discoveries uh, on the ground that are needed to, we, we need to understand in order to understand this effect. And I start with the effect of topology, uh, with this logo here, what it shows is one of the spaghetti that Jen showed, so it's a part of a band structure that I zoom into here, and it shows uh, topological crossing points in this band structure. And um, it has this interesting property of spin momentum locking that uh, Jen was showing on the surface of a topological insulator. In this system, in fact, that's something that can be sitting in the bulk of the solid um, of a three-dimensional semi-metal and will give rise to this uh, non-canceling out Berry curvature effect. So it turns out that these nodes here are sources and sinks of that very curvature. And if the Fermi level, which already you know, it's fantastic, I don't need to explain anything. So if that is close enough to these nodes, what you do when you integrate over the K space, you also need to know that already, uh, you will not cancel out this effect because sort of the Fermi surfaces are close enough around these points so that you have non-cancellating out effects from this Berry curvature. That's the essence, right? If we cancel it out, as Wong uh, explained, there is no net effect over all the case space, over all the hotel rooms, okay? So um, we need to have this Berry curvature as an effect that stays there, that directly can have an effect of the electrons that doesn't cancel out. And uh, if you have such a part of your band structure, you will have that, okay? But I will explain it in some more detail. And uh, that detail starts, you have seen it in three versions now, starts from the atoms. So we need to understand how electrons move in a crystal. Let's briefly look again for the third time so that you will never forget it, <laughs> at what the electrons do in the atoms. And this is the famous Schrödinger equation that captures uh, the behavior of electrons in uh, atoms. Um, that's the Coulomb potential here, and this is the wave function, which you already know. And in fact, what this is, this, uh, the solutions of this equation, um, or in fact, the uh, square, the, the square of the absolute value is the probability of finding an electron in these different energy states, but it's calculated for a single electron. There's one electron described by that, not 10 to power 23, okay, a single one. And we can yet calculate all higher energy states. So this is one of the lowest energy states. In fact, it's one of the second, high, uh, second lowest energy states and go to higher and higher energies, which would be sort of the uh, upper and upper floors. Uh, but uh, we don't need the hotel room yet because we are still in the, in, in the atom. So this really real space here, this is how the electron cloud or the probability of finding the electron distributes around the center of an atom. Okay, you, you recognize the S shape, the P shape, the D shape here. Okay, so now I'm interested in solids. This is my land and it's beautiful because it's the land of everyone because we don't have more than that, that's matter, right? We have the periodic table, that's all we have, but we can do very different things with it. So chemists also love to show it, but solid state physics also like to show it, biologists like to show it, that's what we have. So uh, let's look at uh, a very, very simple metal. What is the simplest metal in here? We have uh, hydrogen, well, that's a gas at ambient conditions, helium as well, but the third one is already a metal. So let's look at that. That's the simplest metal we can imagine. Okay, 
This is the crystal structure of lithium. Lithium crystallizes in a body-centered cubic crystal structure. So you have at each uh, corner of a cube, you have an atom, and in the middle, we have one, two. That's a body-centered cubic. Uh, it looks like this, and it's a metal. You put contacts and it conducts. Wonderful. It's a little bit active, but let's forget about that. <laughs> yeah, we don't really want to work with it, but nevertheless, it's a metal. It's a very good, simple metal. Um, its electronic structure is one for the lowest uh, shell, S2. So the lowest S orbital, the one S orbital is twofold occupied by spin up and spin down. It's not active in the metal, but this one, the second, uh, has one electron, so it's the half-filled uh, S orbital. Okay, now let's put these orbitals, it's just spherical, let's put them in the solid. Let's put them around the atoms. Okay, let's put them in one direction, X direction. They have strong overlap. What does it mean, strong overlap? According to Jen's explanation, it creates a band, and it creates a broad band because the overlap is strong. Okay, we had this T which she was showing, which is the hopping. The larger the overlap, the broader the band. Let's put them in another direction. Much less overlap. In fact, no overlap in my drawing, which is, of course, cutting off. There's, of course, probability down to very far distance. But the band along this direction will be narrower because there's less overlap. So let's look at that. Now we are in the hotel room picture. This is the K space picture. So the reason why we use that momentum space as opposed to real space is that we treat the electrons as waves with the wave function. Um, we have a periodic solid and we use, in fact, the Fourier transform of that wave to describe its energy states. Um, it looks, seems like very complicated, but there's a very simple recipe. It's nothing myster mysterious. So you can, from the real space crystal structure, with a very simple recipe, transform it into the so-called reciprocal or momentum space structure. So there's no, there's, you don't have to worry at all about that. It's very simple, yet not immediately intuitive. So this is what it looks in this momentum space, the crystal structure that you just saw. It's the so-called Brillouin zone, uh, which is sort of the corresponding of the unit cell in the real space. So yeah, the unit cell was just this cube with the atom in the middle, and in the reciprocal space, it looks like that. So the direction, which I alluded to before, with the very strong overlap, is just the x direction. Of course, the same is the y direction, or the z direction and the y direction. They are equivalent, because the symmetry is the same. So all these directions are from this gamma point, which is in the center, to h. Let's, let's look at our map from here to here. It's a very broad band. It's, in fact, I don't know, six, seven, eight uh, electron wide. So that's the band width of that band. Compared to the other one, which is along N, that was the diagonal I was showing. So the diagonal is between Z and X is in fact N from here to here, it's much narrower. So you see that, that's, that's all. It's not much more complicated than that. Um, the Fermi energy is here in this band, so it's a calculation. In fact, Peter Blaha, my dear colleague at my university, is the developer of one of the codes, mean 2 k which Jen did not mention. We have two big codes in Vienna. It's VASP and mean 2 k Both have the W or the V from Vienna in their names, which are very famous DFT codes. Um, so they calculate such structures. It takes them seconds. So he calculated it quickly for me, for lithium, because no one cares about lithium today. And the Fermi energy uh, is here, one knows that, so everything is very simple. Okay, so let me put one more thing in here. The velocity, so we know the velocity, as explained by Huang, is the derivative of the energy with respect to this k, this wave vector, and it's pretty large here because the slope is very steep. So we can calculate properties uh, from this. Um, we can also, and that was also shown by Jen, we can identify from which band the different uh, contribution, or which orbital the different bands uh, steam from, and this is shown by how big the circles are, so contributions from S orbitals 
are mostly down here and up here. This is the bonding bands, it's the anti-bonding bands. Um, then from P, one can see this. So higher up is P orbitals, even higher up is D orbitals. So this is all very easy. They click and have instantaneously all these contributions. Um, there are also different colors in this plot, which I did not allude to yet. And that's something which is very important for the topic of topology. So the different colors have a very bulky name of different irreducible representations, which for us means they have different symmetries. So apparently, you have to be aware of all the symmetries in your system if you want to find a crystal that is so-called topological. And topological means it has points where there is a chance that not the entire Berry curvature averages out, so that there are somehow points that keep that aspect to the crystal. Um, so a typical, this is a, lithium is not a topological material, so it has, it's topologically trivial. And uh, in that, if, if you have such a topologically trivial system, then bands of the same symmetry cannot cross. They have to avoid each other. That's a result, it's the, the calculation knows that, comes out automatically. Um, while bands that have different representations shown in different colors here, they can cross. So they don't know anything about each other because they have different symmetries and then they just can have the same energy. So there can be degeneracies, but that has nothing to do with non-trivial topology here. Okay, so um, let's move to the next. Now let's, we, we will be looking at a material that is um, still described by this spaghetti, so single effective, single electron picture, but which is topological. Um, the first, uh, why semi-metal, I think the first, I guess people are fighting a little bit about that, but the first uh, experimentally identified um, so-called wild semi-metal, which is a topological semi-metal tantalum arsenide. Uh, you, we are picking now much more complicated atoms with many electrons. And in fact, one aspect that is important, which was also you heard in the previous talks already, is the topic of spin-orbit coupling. So if you have a very heavy atom, there will be stronger spin-orbit coupling than in lighter atoms, like lithium has almost none. Um, and that has to do with rel relativistic effects, sort of the relative motion of the electron around the nucleus gives rise to um, spin-orbit coupling, and that is big in heavy elements. Okay, so that's what we have in this, but also it has a special crystal structure. And this crystal structure is called non-central symmetric, and you can see that directly from the structure here. So we always have these space groups that characterize symmetry elements of the crystal structures. And one very important element you can see directly from, the, from looking at the structure. So if you want to mirror atoms at the, by the center of the cell, you, it doesn't work. Atoms don't go into one another. So if you mirror this by the center, there is no atom here. So this is the center, mirror this here, it ends up here. But instead, it's sort of turned around. So what, in fact, you have to do, um, so this is I is for the inner centered uh, tetragonal structure, but the 4, 1 means you have a screw rotation axis. So that means if you want to take that Z axis here, if you want to bring atoms to collapse uh, with each other, if you rotate by 90 degrees, it doesn't work. You can see it again. Rotate by 90 degrees. Uh, this atom will not be going to here, but you need to screw in addition, and the screw is like half the lattice parameter in that direction. So imagine you really push down at the same time, then atoms will collapse. Okay, so that's one very important symmetry element that can lead to, lead to this uh, non-trivial topology. In fact, the spaghetti is shown here. That's a calculation that does already include spin-orbit interaction, and that gives rise to things that are the relevant things for topology here. So we don't really see what's going on there. Let's uh, focus near the Fermi energy. So the zero here means the Fermi energy. And zoom in a bit. 
And what we see is a fact um, at the so-called sigma point, so from gamma to sigma, that is the direction, again, we plot here this reciprocal cell from the center to this point here. We have such a crossing, and such a crossing is what the crossings, hold on, no, not yet here, um, are these Y nodes, okay? Well, we'll explain in a second. So, um, I wanted to explain it in some more detail, but I think it's going, going a bit too far. So, so the, the relevant symmetry elements that you have here is this fourfold screw rotation that I explained, but also these mirror planes. And you see that we have these mirror planes. So there is one mirror plane here. Imagine that you mirror everything by this plane. You actually end up with the same structure and the same for this. So, and these mirror planes just correspond to this point here. So this corresponds, this point here corresponds to this plane. And in fact, around that plane, you will have the formation of these Y nodes if, in addition, you have spin-orbit coupling. So that is, in fact, what is observed. So you are really doing um, this ARPIS experiment that Jen was referring to, and you are looking exactly at that, so closely around this sigma point, which is KY equals zero, so a plane here on this uh, sigma uh, Y direction, and you have these while and anti while nodes sitting exactly here. So that's predicted by this single, impure, single electron theory with just taking the symmetry arguments of this. So that's just all calculated. It comes out like that, and the experiment sees it, all in the single particle picture. So topology is there on that single electron level, OK? This is the Y nodes, right? These uh, things that have linear dispersion, of course, it's fading away because the states above are not occupied and we are drawing them still, right? We just really measure the lower part where the electrons are, sit, are occupying the states. Uh, that is observed in the experiment. So these points here, as I say, they are having very curvature that will not average out over the entire crystal. Okay, so that, in principle, can explain our effect, our Hall effect without a magnetic field. And that can be is, uh, summarized in this slide here. So in 3D, of course, this is, this is an image that is it's sort of a, a mixed uh, representation of the momentum space in this plane, kz and uh, the mean of kx and ky, and then to the top is energy. But in truth, I mean, our k-space is three-dimensional, so it's really like a monopole and an anti-monopole of this Berry flux. So in some way, it's like magnetic monopoles, but in momentum space. That's what these vinyls act like, okay? And if the electron moves by these monopoles, then they will be deviated, just as they are deviated if they move by or move in an electric uh, magnetic field. Right, so what you do, you apply an electric field so that the electrons move. They see this very curvature. The electrons move, so we get some distribution function to be deviated. That's the tilting of the hotel rooms that uh, Huang was talking about. We integrate over all this uh, momentum space, and we get our Hall current. So this is the transverse current corresponds to a transverse force on the electron, just by this very curvature. So in principle, that's what it is. Um, now, it has been calculated how big it would be for this material. This is for tantalum arsenide, a theoretical calculation, just using this formalism and calculating what the effect would be. This is the whole conductivity, and it's found out that is super small. So it's too small to measure. Extremely small effect. In fact, it has not been seen. So hmm, it's a nice thing, but it doesn't work. So good for us. We need correlations. And that's the next and last thing. So how can correlations help to make this effect detectable? Um, I have a logo here. 
um, about a special type of correlations, which is extremely strong. Uh, that's why we're working with this effect. It's called the condo effect. Um, but any other type of interactions between electrons would have, in principle, similar effects. So let me explain that in some detail, but not too much. So what we have in these materials called condo materials, we have two different types of electrons or two different types of orbitals that are relevant. So as said, if the orbital is very large and has very strong overlap with the neighbors, we get a broad band. And let's assume we have that. Just look at the dashed line here. So you recognize the band as we had it in lithium, right? A broad band uh, going from uh, the gamma point to one of the directions, yeah. the H point, for instance. Um, but in addition, we have a second set of electrons, and they are sitting in very, very tiny orbitals. And the tiniest orbitals we can have are 4F orbitals. They are inner orbitals. They are, uh, exist, or they are partially filled in the rare Earth elements. And they are so small that there is actually no overlap between one uh, orbital at one lattice site and the next lattice site. And that means that the band is totally flat. So that's the atomic limit that Jen was showing, was just localized levels, okay? No bandwidth at all, it's totally flat. Now, it turns out that if you are just at low enough temperatures, the interaction between the two subsets will um, lead to an interaction of these localized states, which by themselves they could never do because they don't see each other, but they see the other electrons from the broadbands, and thus the whole thing gets what we say correlated or renormalized, and in fact, sort of a hybridization occurs between this flat state and the broadband, and we get such hybridized bands. And these hybridized bands contain electrons that are very strongly interacting. So electrons that are not behaving as single electron property. So they don't have the mass, for instance, of a single electron, but the mass of like thousand electrons, a thousandfold heavier in the solid. That means they sort of have, find it hard to move, but uh, the added value of that is that their density of states, so the density of states is really how many states um, are there in one band, how many rooms, if you want, in Huang's uh, hotel um, are there per floor, and there are many near the Fermi energy, many, many, many rooms per floor on the given floor. That's a very high electronic density of states because this flat band gets mixed with the broad band, okay? So then you get many. And that can amplify effects of topology because you have so many electrons uh, doing that motion around this very curvature. So many will feel this uh, field, this virtual field, and thus the effect will be amplified. So let's look at the material that does that. Um, and indeed, we put in a, lant uh, a lanthanide, a cerium, which has one 4F electron. Okay, all these here, you fill, fill uh, the very tiny F orbitals. But we put also other elements that are D elements that help to make this interaction and a very heavy element that has very strong spin orbit coupling. So we put everything together that we think makes sense. Um, and then we also choose the right symmetry. I told you the symmetry is very important. So we choose a so-called non-symorphic symmetry, which is also this non-central semantic, so has this screw axis, uh, which is here the, fa the four um, minus is again such a fourfold screw axis. So it has the right symmetry elements so that this uh, Berry curvature, non-canceling effect of the Berry curvature can exist. And we can measure properties that tell us that yes, indeed, this is a very strongly correlated material. And one way to do that is measure in the specific heat. So the specific heat measures how many degrees of freedom you have at low energy. Um, and that tells us that our energy that is now relevant for the system is about 10 Kelvin, which corresponds to one milli electron volts, even though the typical bandwidth of a non-interacting system is an electron volt. 
right? We have now a very small effective energy scale, as if our Fermi energy was decreased by three orders of magnitude. So, or you can see in other words, the band was very wide, it was one electron wide, and now we push it all together to one milli electron volt, and then many, many are at the same energy. Um, again, our dear colleague Peter Blaha, co-developer of V2K, calculated uh, the band structure, and he finds these crossings, these are the wild nodes, but they are far away from the Fermi energy if he uses just this single electron calculation. Well, that's the only thing he can do. It's the code, and that's a single electron calculation. The symmetry is still there, but the electrons are non-interacting, so the bandwidth is broad. So now, yes, the wild nodes are there, but they are not helpful. They will never, ever give the effect that we observe because they are far away from the Fermi energy. We see nothing. So now comes in clever theorists, uh, the group of Chi Miao Si uh, with uh, Xinghua uh, Lai, who um, worked on the theory of this problem. This is my uh, experimental student, uh, Sami Java, and they put a complicated thing, something that's more complicated than our single electron Schrodinger equation that has all the interaction terms, all the symmetry terms, um, something that is in fact very difficult to solve uh, exactly, but then people have developed techniques that solve it approximately, but still to enough confidence that it's true, um, or that is relevant, the result, and what they find if they do such a calculation which has these interactions included that indeed from this very broad bands which do have the crossings, which do have the Y nodes, they get very flat bands, so it's not on scale. This is six electron volt and here's only 0.2 electron volts, get these very flat bands near the Fermi energy. Or in other words, uh, the interaction effect makes that from the from the bandwidth, which is of an elect order of the electron volt, this wild dispersion now is becomes extremely flat and of the order of our 10 Kelvin of the condo temperature. So that's what we have to accept, right? The, the interaction takes these um, crossings from where they are in the band structure, puts them at the Fermi energy in an extremely flat band and that will apparently amplify the effect. So if we put it back into our picture that we had before, well, we do have these hybridized bands, but apparently the symmetry tells us that we cannot open up the gap entirely, but somehow something, we don't know really how to draw it, it's very schematic, some states remain in here which have these crossings. So this is protected by the symmetry of the crystal, and it's very sitting in a very large density of states and th thus can create or amplify this effect. So that's what we have. The amplified effect really comes from piling up hotel rooms at the same energy and they all feel this very curvature, okay? And all get deviated by it. Um, we can estimate the size of this effect and the size of this effect um, is 0.3 in these units, so this is really the transverse conductivity divided by the longitudinal, or we can also define it divided by the electric field that we need to create the effect, and then it gives us some other number. As such, you cannot do anything with it, but I compare it to other systems, and let's do that. In fact, in the meantime, in some non correlated materials, so materials that are really well described by the single effective single electron theory. This effect has been identified and um, the relevant quantity that is really related to the Berry curvature um, is uh, these points here. There's some uncertainty and these points in fact belong here according to the authors. So the effect is like very small, and it could be detected in these systems because they are all essentially very, very thin. And then you can put very large fields on them. Okay, so with few layer thickness of these materials, you can in fact detect the effect. 
But the effect in our system is not at all thin. It's just a bulk material. We put very small electric field. It's much, much, much larger. And we relate this being larger to the flatness of these linear bands. So the linear bands, really, the flatness is the slope. Um, the, or, or the, yeah, this, the slope of the band is the inverse velocity of the electrons, and that's a measure of how strongly, uh, how strong the interactions are. And we see that sort of the shaded uh, line here indicates very big effect for very flat slope or very um, large one over slope. Okay, so it's really directly seen here that if you have strong correlations, this effect is very strongly amplified. Okay, so that's are the things we are, we are discussing in this program and in the, the conference next week. For instance, uh, a talk that will be presented next week uh, from one of my collaborators is that these Y nodes, well, we have detected them already, but interestingly, Y nodes are, uh, Y fermions are really correspondence in the solid, um, that they have a correspondence to the Y particle, and the wild particle is its own antiparticle in high energy physics. And that means you cannot destroy this particle unless the two meet, a particle and its antiparticle meet and annihilate. Okay, that's the only way how you can get rid of these particles, which has to do with the robustness of them. And that uh, we have succeeded by sort of moving them in this momentum space sort of uh, making them meet, even though the rooms are full. And then if they meet, they annihilate. And that will be presented at the conference. Um, another example of what is going to happen at the conference is uh, a talk by uh, Hao Yu Hu from Chimiao C's group, where in, in fact these wild excitations can not only exist in the way we have, uh, uh, I have presented here, but they can also exist in much more exotic form where there are actually no real particles behind. So there's a so-called non-Fermi liquid Y system can exist in some circumstances. So these are the topics we are discussing. How can correlations change existing effects even in the non-interacting level or create entirely new effects uh, like in this case here? Let me show you the last two slides here about what it really is that we do. Okay, so we design in our minds materials or with the help of theoretical predictions, but then we make the materials, we grow the materials. So we have different types of ovens that can actually grow a crystal. This is a so-called mirror furnace with which you can grow pretty large crystals. So this is 10 centi uh, one centimeter scale. Then we have other techniques where we grow smaller samples on the millimeter scale, and we have systems which can grow thin films. It's a molecular beam epitaxy system. It's all ultra high vacuum. It costs a, a fortune, and you can grow very, very thin films. Um, okay, so this is the schemes, how it works. I don't really want to go in the details. You melt it, and you do everything correct, and the crystal comes out miraculously, and here, you really evaporate atom by atom on the substrate, and if you do everything right, which means you can maybe sometimes work for 10 years to do everything right, then you get these highly ordered films. And then you have your crystals, and you need to find whether you actually see what you were hoping for, and you need a lot of equipment. Frequently, we have to cool the sample to very low temperatures, have very advanced electronics to see the effects, Sometimes we don't need so advanced because they are big, the effects. That's the lucky situation, but frequently effects are tiny and spurious, and you have to work very hard to see them. But if you do, then you find a quantum universe in a crystal, and then we are very, very, very happy. Okay, so this is we. Uh, that's the team in Vienna. Uh, we have a lot of funding. We are lucky to be supported strongly by the Austrian Science Foundation and also the EU. And uh, these are the external collaborators, the work of which I directly showed here. And uh, you see it's a, a diverse team, which I'm very happy about. That's one more thing to know about females. They like to cluster. You have one, you have 10. 
You have zero, you have zero. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for your attention. Um, I have a question, maybe to start off. Oh, there's, yeah, maybe I can ask a question because you pulled this material somewhat out of thin air. I was wondering if you could give a little more insight on how you pick the materials that you grow and study. How we pick the material? Yeah. I, I mean, frequently you start by a coincidence. So we were searching for something else. In this material that I showed you, um, this uh, cerium-3, bismuth-4, palladium-3, we were in fact studying other physics and then stumbled across it. That's typically the case. But now, uh, with the collaboration with Chim yao -Si, we actually have very precise suggestions saying, oh, why don't you try that material? Then we try it because it was predicted to show a certain property. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it always gives us a new direction on where to search. The first, thank you for that. That was an excellent explanation of everything. I mean, that was beautiful. I feel, I thought I wasn't going to understand what was happening and I understand so much more. Um, could you go ahead two slides, please? That, when you had the, no, the annihilation, you said that now you, you result with a heavy fermion metal, right, up on top. And I know it's nearly impossible to make and the cost would be excessive, but in the future, is it possible that that type of a system could be used to create a metal that would be so conductive for electronics, for chipsets? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, we have the technology. The technology for chips is here. It's MBE. It's used by big company, big industry, like Microsoft having like giant MBEs and making all these uh, Majorana settings with MBEs. So this is industrial scale. Uh, fabrication with molecular beam epitaxy is absolutely possible. We show that we can grow these type of materials is not the material I showed you. We haven't yet succeeded to grow that, but others with the similar structure. So they can be made as thin films, then it means they can be really tiny chips and you can implement it. Absolutely. Yes. That's a real, uh, that's, that's, it's not tomorrow, but maybe it will come. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's, it's totally feasible. And um, Jen said several times in her talk that we need to bring everything to room temperature. Currently, the quantum industry has abandoned that notion. So the quantum industry is using this kind of uh, dilution refrigerators like we have here. Uh, there is circulating helium-3-4 mixtures. They cool the material down to below a Kelvin, well below a Kelvin, like to 100 or 10 millikelvin, and that exists a thousand times around the world. All the quantum industry has it. So. Currently, quantum technology will work at millikelvin. So that's where our systems work, and that's absolutely feasible. Of course, it's not in your phone, but you know, you don't have to calculate in your phone. You will connect to the quantum computer. The quantum computer is there locally in few places, having such systems, at least at now. That's the, the, the current plan. And you connect to it and calculate there. Just send your job. Yeah, <laughs> it's happening. You can already buy quantum computer time. You can do that. Exists, quantum computers exist. They are not efficient. That's why we are working to bring in topological quantum computation possibly, or having such gadgets like non-reciprocal devices which reduce feedback and everything. So it's a huge uh, field. And if you tell your students who want to study physics, where they will end up, it's, it's quantum technology. Really, definitely, it's a huge, huge thing at the moment, and they can't find enough students, and they really take every, everyone. It's a, no, it's great, totally fantastic, exciting. Um, more questions?
I guess um, I was pretty surprised to see that you see, how did you discover or how did you know that there would be an effect when there's no magnetic field applied? Or was it kind of accidental to discover that? Honestly, this student is really, really smart. So he was reading a lot about these topological materials. And um, I think he was suspecting that he could see it. But it's true. A standard student would never have checked. Usually you don't measure it. You don't, I mean, you measure only in small positive, small negative field. You sort of take the difference. That's how you measure the Hall effect. So most students would never have discovered it. So just to follow up then, did you, did you then introduce a magnetic field on we top can. of it? We can do that, yes. And we did, of course. And can then you... we see something very interesting that this effect extends to finite magnetic fields and you get a Hall signal that's very different from a normal Hall effect. A normal Hall effect is always anti-symmetric in field. But here it's a symmetric effect because the field isn't creating the effect. So the field is only, in fact, what it is doing is, and that's, in fact, the work of Sarah Grather, who is here. Where is Sarah? She's there. She understood that what the magnetic field does with these Y nodes in momentum space so they will move towards each other or move in momentum space. And it can happen that they will actually meet. That's what the magnetic field does. So in overall, it weakens the effect until they, know they, they meet and then it's gone. And that's also a very nice proof that is really due to that. So once you have reached a certain field, uh, the effect is totally gone because the Y nodes are no longer there. And the second proof is that if we measure at high temperatures where all this interaction physics isn't yet there, there's also nothing. So you need the low temperatures so the interaction physics builds up. And then you need zero field, so it's there. But if you kill the effect with field, it will be gone again. So it's really quite obvious this very curvature is there and is doing it. Um, is a this is probably technically really challenging, but because these effects are so sensitive to orbital overlap, do people look at the effects of pressure, high pressure, on oh, these yeah. many electron effects? Yeah, definitely. That's something we do a lot in these interacting electron systems, because there, indeed, the pressure, if you just put everything a bit closer together, the over orbital overlap is even stronger, and that will have quite drastic effects, yes. We, we work a lot with uh, pressure. Currently, we are in fact studying these materials under pressure and see whether we get stronger or weaker effect. And it's a very interesting uh, thing to do. Yes. So um, the question I had was um, the crystals that you're growing or the thin film that you fabricated in the, M the MBE, are they actually, are they, uh, objects that exhibit um, uh, topological, are, are the examples of topological insulators? Um, no, currently we have only a material that's topologically trivial that we grow in very high quality. Sorry, it's here. So uh, this is a material that is very, very interesting, but it's topologically trivial. So it doesn't have the correct crystal structure. Um, but we are currently, right now, in this uh, cell, we have the cerium, the palladium, and the bismuth, and we are doing the first growth of that material in thin film form. So we are just now trying. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? OK. Great. If we got everyone's questions in, then let's thank Silka again. <laughs>